And for this session, I'm delighted to say we've got three uh, alumni uh, who have uh, spent some time uh, studying in Japan at Japanese universities of various uh, lengths of time. Uh, and so I'd like each of them to come up in turn to give a 10-minute presentation on their experiences, after which we'll ask them to go to the top table, and then it'll be your chance to ask any questions you have to them. Okay, so our first speaker is Alexandra uh, Zemushevska, uh, who has just recently graduated from SOAS, uh, the University of London, uh, and uh, Alexandra studied uh, for a year at Hitotsubashi University in Japan, one of the leading universities in Japan. So, Alexandra. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, so my presentation is divided into four parts, uh, seasonal parts. So I'll be talking about my year abroad in the seasonal frame. Um, first of all, so starting with autumn, uh, I went to Hitotsubashi University, which is uh, on the suburbs of Tokyo. It's roughly 25 to 30 minutes by train from the very center, from Shibuya Station. And uh, at SOAS, I studied Japanese and history of art. So although I really wanted to gain experience in, in Japanese culture and art, I chose to study in Tokyo for several reasons. And I chose Hitotsubashi University uh, because it gave me the opportunity to live both very close to the, to the amazing city, which is Tokyo, and to experience the life in a slightly smaller town of Kunitachi, where the university is based. Um, so I arrived in, in Japan in the end of September, and uh, I knew only one person from my course who was attending the same university. Uh, so it was a really, really pleasant surprise to, to discover that the university really prepared uh, our uh, orientation week. Uh, first of all, they organized this wonderful uh, Kodaira welcome week, and we had a lovely uh, welcome party. This is at my dorm. So it was a great opportunity to really get to know other people at your course and other people studying in university. There will be both international and Japanese students. Uh, I lived in a flat with five other uh, girls. Uh, four of them were international students from various countries like Taiwan, China, Russia. And one was a Japanese student from Hitotsubashi University. Uh, so one of the parts I really enjoyed about my, about my year abroad was the fact that I could bike to my university. So I really biked uh, throughout the whole year, and it was a really wonderful experience to kind of to be able to do that. Uh, it's very difficult to do it in London if you live so far. Uh, but in Japan it was great. But of course you can commute quite easily as well by train. Uh, so just to mention quickly, autumn is probably the most amazing time in Japan, and uh, if you do go there uh, in the autumn, make sure you take advantage of the wonderful uh, autumn leaves, uh, so koyo. Uh, I was very lucky to go to Nikko at the time, but of course, no matter where you go, I've, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, okay, so moving on to winter. Uh, so one of the things that my university also organized was uh, a seminar called Experience Japan Program. And that was basically a program of various cultural events that all international students could attend. And one of them was a tea ceremony. I've never done it before, so it was a really wonderful experience to, to get to know this, this part of Japanese culture. But uh, I would like to stress out that it's quite important to get to know your local community. So I lived in a place called Kodaira, which is again like roughly 40 kilometers from central Tokyo, and it's a really small town. Uh, but they have a very lively uh, local community and they organize quite a lot of different events. So one of uh, the courses or events they organized was Ikebana course. And I was very lucky to actually be, to attend uh, those classes and it was a really wonderful experience again, you know, to, to get to know Japanese people who are organizing those things. Um, uh, also a local community in Kunitachi, so where Hitotsubashi University is, is located, organized uh, Seijin Shiki, so the coming of age ceremony which you can celebrate when you uh, turn 20. And uh, again, a, a local ladies uh, organized kimonos and they actually helped us you know, get ready for, for the uh, Seijin Shiki celebration and we could attend the town hall uh, for the Seijin Shiki uh, together with Japanese students. Uh, so I think Christmas is a time that everyone kind of fears of you know, like you don't want to really stay in Japan because you want to visit your family. And it might, be, it might seem a bit lonely, but I think Christmas time actually is quite, uh, quite nice in Japan. Uh, of course, it doesn't uh, only entail Kentucky Fried Chicken and Strawberry Cake, which is how Japanese people really uh, celebrate Christmas. But it's a really wonderful time to, when you can you know, travel a bit and get to know again people. And uh, it's really worth staying, I think, for New Year's Eve. 
Uh, I would really recommend going to, again, a local temple rather than going to a big party in Shibuya. It's, it's really a, a magical experience to be able to, uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, and again, just a bit of traveling. This is my biggest hobby, so that's why I'm throwing you <laughs> all these pictures. Uh, winter is, again, really surprising in Japan. It's a lot, there is a lot of snow, so if you're a fan of skiing, you can definitely do that in Japan. And traveling, especially to Kawaguchiko to see Mount Fuji, again, something I would definitely recommend. Okay, so moving on to spring. Uh, well, obviously, all you know, Hanami. And uh, for Hanami, the first picture is from uh, the Meguro River in, uh, in Tokyo. That's probably one of the pl best places where you, can, where you can really see Hanami. But no matter where you go, pretty much every single Japanese garden will have a Hanami tree. So it's, it's again, a really wonderful you know, time to, uh, to get to, to know any Japanese places. Um, what I would again suggest uh, if you're thinking of going to, to study in Japan is uh, to join a society. Uh, so clubs and societies have, uh, play a very important role in Japanese universities. And clubs are a bit intense because they require you to actually put some effort into, into sports you're doing. So it might be a bit difficult for exchange students especially to be able to join them because you know, they don't want people just to, to join for a couple of days a week. They, they want you there all the time. But societies are a bit more relaxed, so they're just like, places where you can try out a new sport. And I was very lucky to join the Kendo Society at, at my university. And it was a really wonderful experience to, to be able to talk you know, to Japanese people outside of class. And I think this is uh, something that you can definitely use to improve your language. Because language classes, of course, you know, it's just mostly writing and actually do a lot of you know, language learning outside of class. So societies are a great you know, way to do that. And there are so many different ones. So it doesn't matter whether you'd like to join a choir, a music society, or any sports. Really, there's probably everything you, know, you can imagine. Um, another way to contribute to the local community and to be able to use the resources they have is to do school visits. Uh, some of them are voluntary, but some of them actually are willing to, uh, to pay you for, for visiting uh, primary schools. And that basically entails just you know, saying a couple of words about the country where you're from and just talking to the children. Uh, it's, it's again a really good way to, to get to know the, the local uh, people who want to engage with international students. Okay, so moving on to summer. Uh, again, just a couple of pictures I took during summer. Summer is a bit rainy in Japan, but um, that's also the time when the biggest festival, Obon, takes place. Uh, so I don't, uh, it really depends whether you're a fan you know, of the cultural stuff in Japan, but festivals are probably the best time when you can discover Japanese food, Japanese music, and you know, more traditional arts. So definitely try to you know, go to as many as you, know, as you can. And uh, Obon takes place really everywhere in Japan, so no matter where you go, you'll be able to, to experience it. Um, yes, I think Japanese food is worth mentioning. I'm sure you all are fans of you know, sushi and ramen. Uh, but it's quite difficult to actually get vegetables in Japan. Uh, and I think you should uh, keep it in mind that uh, changing you know, your taste to Japanese cuisine might be a bit tough if you don't want to eat fish all the time. Of course, vegetables are you know, all there, but they're quite expensive. So just keep it in mind that you'll probably have to switch to cooking Japanese food. I personally love Japanese food, so I had no problems with it. My favorite dish was takoyaki, which is the fried octopus in a, like a pancake doughy kind of thing. And uh, I, I really loved it, so I just switched completely to cooking Japanese things, and I was all right. Uh, yeah, and just a couple of words about Tokyo. It's, uh, I, I really wanted to study in Tokyo, as, as I think Tokyo offers so many different things that you can experience, you know, just different exhibitions that I was interested in and different festivals going on. And um, I guess what I mean to say is that your experience will be probably completely different to mine, and it's really up to you to make the most out of your year. So when I was going to Japan, I actually came here to, you know, to listen to, to what people were saying and uh, to listen to their advice. And then I got to Japan, I completely forgot about the advice people have given me, because you'll make you know, the experience your own, no matter what you want. So just a couple of uh, things I, I would like to mention is make sure you, you research the university you're going to, so you know what courses they offer and what sort of societies they offer, if it's possible. Make sure you, you, you know uh, what sort of place you're going to, whether it's going to be rural or, or city-based. But um, I'm sure you're going to love your experience, and I would definitely recommend going to Japan. It was a wonderful year, and uh, really, just I, I hope it was useful. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Alexandra. OK, next up, we have uh, Ryan Yassin. And uh, Ryan is uh, doing a, a master's program at the Royal College of Art. And part of his program, he, he spent some time studying at Keio University. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Ryan. And just to give you a brief background of my background, uh, I studied aeronautical engineering at Imperial College. Um, and I wanted to use my technical skills in a more creative way. So when I finished that degree, I looked for another one, which was global innovation design. So for, as I was applying for this course, I knew that I'd be entering KU University, as I knew that that was part of the course curriculum. Uh, the course is split between New York, London, and Tokyo, and it's supposed to give you a multidisciplinary um, view of the world. And um, and I think going to Japan really gave you that like cultural. You were thrown in the deep end of of that culture, and you were able to learn from this other culture. And it opened your mind uh, in terms of what things could, how things could be done in a different way. So. I was working on a fashion project in, in, uh, in Tokyo. And what I did was I searched for a user group. So one method of design is, is user-centered design. So what I did was I searched for an extreme user group of fashion so um, I could design for them, see what their uh, requirements were, and then see how that would fit into a mass market in the future. So I found this uh, video blogger uh, who was bilingual. And through her, I managed to enter the whole society of Harajuku fashion and be able to ask them questions. And I'm only including this because I, I just want you to remember that you're in another city um, for you know, a limited duration of time. And you need to make use of every opportunity you have. And like you should make opportunities for yourself while you're there as well. Uh, so I ended up merging the engineering and the aesthetic fashion by, by making this uh, pleated structure and I put a shape memory alloy, which is a metal which actuates. So the problem was that um, these people are isolated when they travel on the tube because um, people just look at them and, and they're wearing all this colorful, beautiful stuff. And uh, it's not part of the norm. So people don't sit next to them. People point at them. People stare at them. And what I sought to do was actually to fix that and, and give them a, a way of fitting in, as well as flourishing upon entering Harajuku. Um, what was great about this was that all the, um, the hack space that was available at KU University um, was open 24 hours. They had sewing machines, laser cutters. And so again, it was being in that environment and using as many of the opportunities that I could um, while I was there, using all the facilities that they had. Uh, another project that I was working on was um, self-perception and psychology. So how people perceive themselves when they look at a photograph of themselves, and how that varies from when you look at yourself in the mirror, for instance. And uh, the tutors were extremely helpful there and were giving me access to technology, which I wouldn't have been able to have access to. So I used eye trackers to see how people perceived their, a picture of themselves. and how other people perceived a photo of themselves. So life in Tokyo, um, it really is a parallel universe. Uh, so as a designer, I think this was extremely important for me because it totally opened my eyes as to how things can be done in a different way. So it's, there's a form of design called speculative design, which is saying, what if the world was like this? And I think Tokyo was a perfect example of that because there are so many things which are just slightly different and, and just so <coughs> alien, yet they fit into this, this whole ecosystem, which is very similar. You know, It's a city. It still has cars, still has tarmac buildings, everything. But everything is done in a slightly different way. People queue up for the tube, and um, the food is different. The, the way they source their food is different. Um, and then this is just to talk about Sakura and, and the attention to detail that the Japanese people have, um, and their appreciation of natural things. Um, so this is the cherry blossom, the haname, which um, uh, was just talked about. Um, and I didn't, I didn't see what the beauty was uh, regarding sakura before it happened. Um, I just thought, OK, fine, the, the flowers are going to blossom, and that's it. But when it happened, you, and, and you could see the petals falling from the sky, from, from the trees, sorry, um, to the ground and uh, glistening in the, in the sun, you, you really built that appreciation for what these other people appreciated. And this, this beautiful 
act that brought people together, um, brought their communities together, brought um, co-workers together to drink and, and just be happy after work and celebrate. And you just saw the beauty in something that you hadn't seen the beauty in before. Um, the food, uh, totally. Um, I wasn't eating fish before I went to Japan, so like it was a big, uh, scary thing for me. Uh, but now I am a uh, an advocate of sushi. Uh, like I love sushi, so <laughs> go. You'll find you'll be fine. Like you'll find whatever food suits your style, and like you'll slowly build like uh, a liking for it. Japanese craft was something which I explored as much as possible. So the washi making, the metal working, you know, every, I'm sure lots of you know about the um, Japanese knives, they're world renowned for it. Their ceramics and their lacquerware. Um, and I think looking at these fundamental uh, crafts has really opened my eyes in my disciplines at the moment. So I'm directly being inspired by the washi paper making in a fashion project that I'm doing now, which is looking at uh, new ways of manufacturing garments. And I'm sure if you come from a business background or any background, you will find inspiration in these really fundamental crafts and fundamental Japanese um, cultural um, exhibits. Um, and I think you should really explore those and really look out for those and grab any opportunity that you can while you're there to really, yeah, find out more. Something that really stood out to me uh, was the architecture in Japan. So I went to an island called Naoshima, which is an art island, and I highly recommend that you go there. Um, so Tado Ando is, is mainly the, the main architect on that island, and his work is absolutely stunning. Um, and I mean, if you don't have an appreciation for architecture, I'm sure you will, even if you go there, because it's just, it just, it's a different way of doing things, again. And it's just eye-opening and inspiring. Um, and Isimiyaki, uh, on the right there, there was an exhibition in the Tokyo Art Museum. And uh, he proved to be a huge inspiration for, where, for me actually starting my fashion project in Japan. Nature, you're never too far away from nature. Um, the top two images are only an hour and a half by train uh, from the center of Tokyo in Kamakura. Um, highly recommend that you just travel and go to these rural parts. Uh, look out for hikes that you can do. Try and do Mount Fuji if you have time. Um, and just go exploring as much as you can. Um, basically, you're only there for a certain amount of time. So just really like take any opportunity that you can and research as much as you can um, and put yourself out of your comfort zone, you know? Like, if you, if there are things that don't necessarily take your fancy on paper, just try it out and then decide, because it might actually be amazing and it might actually be insightful and eye-opening. Uh, so if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to email me. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Okay, so... Uh, our third speaker is uh, Forum Mutani, and Forum uh, is a PhD student at, at SOAS at the University of London. Uh, and Forum spent uh, some time uh, studying at Corbe Gakuin University and also Sophia University. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yes, thank you for the introduction. I'm Forum. And, um, I have quite a long potted history with Japan and Japanese studies. Um, I first started studying Japanese um, more than 20 years ago. Um, so what my talk is going to be, I'm not, because my experiences of studying in Japan were actually quite a while ago, I'm not going to be focusing too much on the, on university life and academic life and all those details because um, things have changed quite a bit. But I'm going to talk more in general about my experiences of studying Japanese and Japan, um, and a bit about my life in Japan outside of the academic sphere, and also what I've been doing since then and how my experiences of Japan and Japanese um, have um, affected my life and influenced me and. Um, and a bit about what I'm doing now. Um, OK, so to just give a very brief sort of history, my CV. Um, so I did a, um, a BA in Japanese studies at Leeds. Um, 
and as part of that, I spent a year at Kobe Gakuin University. After graduation, I um, spent a year working in London, so I worked for trying to use my Japanese as much as possible. So I worked at a life insurance, Japanese life insurance company. I also worked at Hitachi. Um, but I had already applied for a MEXT scholarship, so then I went to Tokyo, and I'll talk a little bit about that scholarship as well. Um, but then I, so that's when I went to um, Tokyo, and um, I was ended up being in Tokyo for about three and a half years. Um, and then I came back, um, and I did a master's in journalism studies um, in London, um, then I worked as a journalist and a media analyst for a what, few years, and I'm currently at SOAS doing a PhD. So, um, so as part of my first degree, I spent a year at Kobe Gakuin University, and um, I'm not going to go too much into it. It was quite a long time ago, but um, Kobe, which perhaps you already know, is quite a big sort of quite an international city, a port city in West Japan. Um, but I was in the west of Kobe, so it wasn't a, the, the, you know, it wasn't a, I wasn't in the city, I wasn't in the centre of Kobe. I was quite in a fairly sort of rural, suburban slash rural part of Kobe, close to Akashi. Um, and I, I really am pleased that I ended up there. It wasn't necessarily, at that time, we didn't get a choice, much choice as to where we ended up for our year abroad. But I know that there were people that, that did go to Tokyo and to other big cities. And I'm really glad, actually, that I didn't go to a big city um, because I was in this ar area where, you know, our, next to our dorm, there were, you know, rice fields. And that really helped. The fact that I went to quite a small private university in Japan, um, which didn't have a huge English language program or anything. So I wasn't surrounded by lots of foreigners or lots of um, Japanese who spoke really good English. Um, it was really quite a sort of um, fairly isolated place. And that really helped me um, to improve my Japanese because I, I, I went there having done a year at university and really didn't really know much Japanese at all. And um, in six months, I was really speaking quite, quite well. Um, so I did a one-year Japanese language program there. I had classes in, um, I t we were allowed to audit classes. So I cl audited classes in law and German, which were, were for Japanese students. Um, and I organized a short homestay by myself in Hiroshima, um, with um, staying with the family of a, of a Japanese student um, during the new year. Um, and I took part in extracurricular activities, so Nihonbuyo, which is a tra traditional Japanese dance. You can see me there. Um, I joined the photography club. I was really into photography, and I, I took a lot of photographs of my travels. Um, and we had quite a few excursions that were arranged by the international office. So, for example, we went to Amanohashidate, which I think is one of like, the three most beautiful spots in Japan, and I really recommend you visit it. Um, and so then I, after I graduated from Leeds, I went back on a 18 month MEXT scholarship. And I think the, the Embassy of Japan have a booth here and they'll be able to tell you more about the scholarship. Um, you can either go for 18 months or two years. I decided to go for 18 months. And it's um, really for people who have finished their degrees and want to do some research in Japan to extra uh, and many people go on to do a master's degree or a PhD on this scholarship. Um, but I, I didn't do that. I, um, I did my 18 months at Sofia University, which is in the center of Tokyo. And um, I res my research topics were Japanese literature and film. And I also took extra classes in language and translation, literature, East Asian studies. Um, and they have a very good, um, at least they did, and I'm sure they still do have a very good um, English um, I think it's called Comparative Studies Program, which is in English. You can take classes in English. Um, and then what I, after I did my 18 months at Sofia, although I was very, I found the classes very interesting. I learned a lot um, about literature and film, but I wasn't still quite sure. I knew I wanted to do further study, do a master's and a PhD, but I wasn't quite sure 
exactly what I wanted to study. I felt like I didn't know Japan well enough yet. Like I'd experienced it as a student, but I wanted to experience it more as an ordinary person. Um, so I started to take a two-year career break, um, and I, I got, I'd got married while I was there. So we decided to stay in Japan and sort of just have an ordinary life in Japan. Um, so, um, what I, so I was basically a housewife and a mother for a couple of years in Japan, and um, I joined lots of local community groups, volunteering. Um, I read a lot in my own time. Um, I, can, you know, I watched a lot of television. I did lots of ordinary things. Um, I wanted to experience day-to-day -day life in Japan as close to I, as I could as a Japanese person. Um, so, for example, I joined a driving school and I learned how to drive and I got my li license in Japan. Um, and I felt these experiences were really good. I think there's a lot of focus on when you go there, especially for a short term, or you're going there for a specific purpose like work or study, that you're going to, you know, you live, sometimes you can sort of easily go and get into a bubble. You're in a, living in a bubble where you're just focusing on your studies or you're focusing on your work. And I think it, it's also interesting, um, or it's also important, especially if you're interested in taking Japanese studies further, um, to actually experience um, ordinary life in Japan. So take some time out and, and find out about your local community, get involved with the people, you know, the, the ja Japanese people around you, um, as well as all those other, thing, other opportunities that you have, which are great as well. So when I came back after um, three and a half years in Japan, I um, decided that I was really interested. I'd read a lot of stuff. I'd read a lot, um, consumed a lot of media, watched a lot of television. I was really interested in the media and the way the Japanese media was different from the British media. And I wanted to learn more about media, about, you know, sort of from more of an academic point of view. So I decided to do an MA in journalism studies. Um, and after, did, after I did that, I um, worked as a freelance journalist and copywriter and um, later as a media analyst. So I wrote lots of features um, mostly for about niche financial markets and travel and careers and property. And I wrote some, some of my features were inspired by my um, life in Japan. Um, and then as a media analyst, I was um, employed by um, um, international clients to analyze sort of their, their, their print media, um, which um, would, to help them with their public relations. Um, and so the, these experiences gave me sort of invaluable writing skills, researching, interviewing skills, and a good understanding of how the media operates. And this was really useful, um, or has been really useful for my PhD, which I'm doing now, which is in Japanese studies, and I'm doing it at SOAS. And the research topic sort of combines some of my experiences in Japan as a, as a mom, as well as um, my knowledge of the media. Um, and I've managed to get some funding for my PhD from the British Association of Japanese Studies and the Sasawakawa Foundation and SOAS, which um, funded my fieldwork trip to Tokyo. Um, and I've presented at several national and international conferences on my research. Um, I've published a paper. And outside of my PhD, um, I've also um, edited a, a journal of postgraduate research. I've organized conferences and talks. I've done some outreach work, and that involves teaching classes and workshop, workshops in Japanese language and culture. Um, I do that for SOAS as part of their outreach um, work. So we off, I, I've had um, students come in and I've taught them a week of Japanese language and culture, and I've also gone into schools and taught um, Japanese in schools. Um, there's also um, opportunities for training and consultancy work um, as a researcher, as a specialist in, in Japan. Um, for example, earlier this year, I did some work for, the, for a BBC Radio 4 documentary on the fifth year of the tsunami disaster. And um, my, another example, not me personally, but my supervisor was recently involved in um, some con consultancy work for um, a new Amazon Prime television show, um, which has some Japanese cultural aspects to it, and she advised on that, which was really exciting, I think. <laughs> 
Um, I also do some voluntary work. Um, after the tsunami disaster, I got involved with a charity called Fukushima Friends UK, which is an educational charity. And I'm now a trustee of that charity. And um, in the summer, we sent a couple of English teachers over to Japan to teach uh, you know, a fully funded, free um, two-week English course for Japanese children. Um, and I'm also involved with the British Association of Mech Scholars. Um, and I help organize events. Um, so mainly my, um, I guess what I want to say with, say from my experiences, the advice I would give is um, there are lots of opportunities in Japan, lots of things you can do. Um, sometimes it's interesting to look outside of all of work and um, university and study and all these great opportunities that which of course you should also um, enjoy, but to actually see beyond there and see what other things are out there, um, experience Japan in a different way, perhaps. Um, and there's lots, many opportunities um, when you come back from Japan, if you do come back. Um, there's lots of things, and there's lots of ways in which you can use your knowledge and your experience, uh, even ways that perhaps you, you don't imagine. Um, but anyway, um, I hope you will um, have a successful and enjoyable time in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Forum. Okay, I'd like to now ask our three speakers to come to the top table, um, where they will now like to field questions from the audience. So if you have, if you have a question, please put your uh, please raise your hand, and a mic will come round. Uh, what's the thing that you enjoyed most when you stayed at Japan? So I went to Naoshima, which was probably my favorite thing, um, and experiencing the this whole island, which was just built for art and architecture. Uh, but something that was extremely fun, actually, was go-karting in Tokyo, <laughs> on, the, on the streets of Tokyo. Um, you can hire just a normal go-kart and just go around on the streets of Tokyo acting like Super Mario, so that was probably <laughs> the most fun thing, and I would highly recommend that if you have a driving license. Yeah, so uh, for me it would be probably traveling as well. Uh, I think I enjoyed most my uh, traveling in the Izu Peninsula. Uh, it's like kind of a forgotten part of Japan, but I would really recommend you go there. And I went there just with two of my friends, and it's if you travel in a small group of people, it's actually quite easy to uh, meet Japanese people along the way, and it was a really, really good experience to to be able to speak, you know, in Japanese and learn more about the uh, local attractions that we wouldn't have, you know, known about uh, if it hadn't been for our Japanese. Uh, so it was a really wonderful, you know, um, just time to be able to, you know, see that my Japanese language skills can actually, you know, um, can be can be can be useful in a way. And uh, yeah, and traveling in Japan is really a wonderful opportunity as well as really there isn't, there isn't a place you can go and you'll be disappointed, I think. So probably traveling to Izu would be my favorite time. Um, well, I also enjoy traveling, but I'm gonna give a different answer just to be a little bit different. Um, but I'm gonna say the friendships that I made, because um, was, it was in Tokyo for three years and I joined various um, local community groups um, and I really, enjoyed the friendships. I'm, I'm really grateful for the friendships that I made there with other Japanese um, women. Um, it's, I'm still friends with them now. I'm still in touch with them now, um, even after all these years. And um, I think those, when I think about my favorite memories of Japan, it's those moments when I'm spending time with them. I'm just wondering, um, to make the most of your first time visit uh, to Japan, be it for studies or other purposes, how much comment of Japanese would you recommend us to already have had? Like, how, how long should you at least have studied it to, to have enough basic skills to, to really just experience um, properly? Okay, so um, you can easily get by in Japan if you don't speak any Japanese, like in Tokyo and Kyoto at least. But it definitely helps if you have basic knowledge of at least hiragana and katakana, so the two basic alphabets. And if you can speak some colloquial Japanese, it definitely helps you to get around. I went to Japan after two years of studying at SOAS, so my level was kind of like 
higher intermediate, let's say. So I was able to express myself, although not very well. And I, I think it was a good time to go to be able to make a big improvement into you know, being able to use Japanese in a colloquial way. But I think, uh, I think that if you go not knowing Japanese, you can make a very fast progress that you probably wouldn't have made in Japan, uh, in here in the UK, because you're, you know, you're surrounded with uh, with Japanese language. So I'm not sure you know, what would be the best time to go, but I would say probably if you know hiragana, katakana, and have some basic knowledge of Japanese, of spoken Japanese, I think that's when you can make really just make the most out of, of, out of the opportunities that, uh, that are offered in Japan. Yeah, I actually went with extremely basic um, conversational Japanese, which I'd learned in the couple of months before going. Uh, and I got by just fine, even in the rural areas. It was more difficult there. Um, but if all else fails, sign language <laughs> is great, and Google. <laughs> Google helps a lot. So I wouldn't let language be a barrier or a restrictor to you even thinking about going, because you're going to learn so much um, just through experiencing, maybe even experiencing different ways of communicating to people. You know, That could be insightful. I'd actually recommend if you don't have much Japanese to go to one of the to more rural areas. I think it's very easy if you don't have much Japanese and you go to a big city to sort of end up with lo with other English speakers. And I think you perhaps you need to challenge yourself if you're up to the challenge. If you're not, um, if if you're able to take on that challenge, you're not. You know, it depends on your personality as well. But I actually recommend that's because I only did a ja year of Japanese at university before I went. Um, and I went to a fairly, you know, more, not rural, but, you know, it was a bit more isolated um, place. And I thought that I found that really, because I, I, I have, when I was in Sofia, which, is, uh, which was an English-speaking campus, so even the Japanese students there spoke really good English, because um, you need to have really good English level to get into that university in the first place. Um, I was, by that time, I'd already done a degree in Japanese. My Japanese was, was quite good, so it was okay. But I could imagine if I'd gone there first, um, center of Tokyo, big city, lots of you know, in foreigners and English speakers, I don't think that my Japanese would have improved as much. And I could see other people that struggled to learn much Japanese in a year there um, because ev everyone around them was speaking English. Uh, my question is, having gone there and experienced uh, what it's like to living in Japan, uh, are you thinking of going back in the future? So my course is a 12-person course, and we all travel together as a team to the different countries. Uh, the year above me, there are three or four of the 12 people who have already moved back because they love it so much. So. Um, personally, I want to work in London or another city for a couple more years before thinking of making such a move. But I would, yeah, wholeheartedly move back um, to cities within Japan because I just love the life there. It's a, it's a, it's an incredible, safe, tasty, amazing, <laughs> clean, tasty. yeah, clean life. Like it's just, it's just everything is so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so uh, in my course we had, I think, 40 people, and at least 20 is already back in Japan working there on either teaching English on JET programs or actually started having started their jobs. Uh, as for me, I'm doing a graduate study now in London, and I think uh, I, w I wouldn't like to move to Japan right now, but that's for, um, f for the reason for the reasons that are related to what I want to do in the future, rather than uh, my experience in Japan. Uh, I really think that Japan is a wonderful place to live, and it really depends on what you want to do. I want to work in art business, so I think it's better for me to kind of stay in London and start my career here rather than in Tokyo. Uh, but I really think that uh, if you find the right opportunities, it's quite easy to stick around in Japan, and so definitely a good place to, to live. Um, I mean, with I'm I'm a PhD researcher now, and um, I study Japanese, Japan, Japanese studies. So yes, I, I mean, definitely. I don't know about long term, but certainly I will be. I'm sure I will be going back. Um, I mean, I have been several times back for my research, and I'm sure I will be going back at some point. Um, I wouldn't say that Japan is perfect, but 
I think once you get, I think that's when, I think when you get out of the bubble of studying, then perhaps you see more, you know, Japan as with all of its, you know, as it really is. Um, but it's definitely, um, in some ways, it's the faults that make me want to go back. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a very interesting place. Okay, I think we're a little bit out, just out of time now, but um, our three alumni will be at the alumni booth uh, through to six o'clock, so if you have any questions, you can go up there and ask them directly. I'm sure they'll be very happy to speak to you. And uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Alexandra, Ryan and Forum for sharing their experiences with us today.